I have really not known anything other than pain for three, over three decades. And all I needed was just the pain to be taken away. And this is what was taking me to hospital. I decided to bring hospital to the house. I started injecting myself painkillers. Unfortunately, these painkillers were not just any other painkillers. They were the very, very strong and effective opioids. And that is how I went down the drain. I got hooked. I got addicted. I became a shell of myself. My name is Teresa Barasa, um, commonly known by many as Trish. My first one is now 24, she's working, and um, the little one is 15. Uh, he is in high school, and I am a loving daughter to one deceased parent and a living parent, my mom. From a very early age, uh, life has really just thrown curveballs at me and it's pain after pain after pain and then came the, the diagnosis initially we didn't even know what it was so for three decades I knew nothing but pain and it started off with lupus at a very early age in my teens and pain, joint pains, and all other kind of pains, including headaches. And as that was settling in, another diagnosis hit me. And this time the abdominal pain was not just because of the lupus. I was an endometriosis patient. The surgery confirmed it. Slowly after, the fibroids checked in. It was just one fibroid. It was seven fibroids that needed to be removed because they were causing havoc through my life. And later in my 30s, the endometriosis is not just existing on its own, there is also adenomyosis. Almost forgetting coccidinia. Coccidinia had worked with me throughout my 20s. And then later on, a coccygectomy because an accident had broken my cervix. It was a fractured cervix. This left me with residual pain, what doctors sometimes call phantom pain. I have really not known anything other than pain for three, over three decades. And this literally put me down. Sometimes I'd not even go to work because of the pain. Um, and little did I know that I was finding a way around it. I was getting to know what doctors were giving me and I was getting this for myself. And by the time it got to opioids, I slowly found myself sourcing for these opioids myself. And at one point I was taking the tablets and then ultimately Having injected my own sister who um, had TB and needed streptomycin injections, I realized I could avoid and cut out all these hospital visits and trips and time wasted. And they, the doctors are asking you for, you know, your history, your last monthly period. And all I needed was just the pain to be taken away. And this is what was taking me to hospital. I decided to bring hospital to the house. I started injecting myself painkillers. Unfortunately, these painkillers were not just any other painkillers. They were the very, very strong and effective opioids. And that is how I went down the drain. I got hooked. 
I got addicted. I became a shell of myself. I have journeyed with chronic conditions and autoimmune disorders for the past three decades, perhaps over. Our healthcare system is not the best and you may not know, accurately have a diagnosis at the right time. Um, so it may be over, but for three, three decades, I have journeyed with chronic conditions and uh, autoimmune disorders. Through it all, my best moments, my happiest moments are really the times I'm well. Like right now, I'm really feeling good about myself because I am not feeling, well, there's little pain somewhere, but I'm not feeling pain. It's not intense. The saddest moments have been when the pain is intense and when, um, like in the recent past, last year, just before surgery, I actually at some point told, told God to take this cup away from me because those have been really tough and hard moments. When the pain is intense, when you cannot go through a natural call, when your nerves are entrapped and compressed, when the feet are swollen so badly, when the heart feels so heavy, or when the head is pounding so hard and everything inside you wants to get out of your body, including the inside itself. It's like turning around a, a piece of cloth and you're nauseous and the anxiety and the many nights I sit up, not because I do not want to enjoy a good night's sleep, but because it is not within reach. But through this all, I have um, I've come to learn that it's not just a personal journey, but that it's interwoven with many others whom I advocate for, for the paths we have traveled. Similar or not exactly similar, but still a path of physical affliction. My journey is very complex, but I'll try and capture the now and then we will keep going back in the process. About um, six, seven months ago, uh, eight months ago, I had a major surgery um, to remove endometrial tissue. Endometrial tissue, uh, for most of us who don't understand uh, the terms, even I didn't until I finally got the condition. Endometrial tissue, is tissue that normally lines a woman's uterus, a woman who's of reproductive age. And it's just tissue, it's like, yeah. And when it responds to the hormone, the, the hormone cycle, when it's time for your periods, this is what sheds out of your uterus and uses the cavity through the vagina, cervix vagina, and you, you have what you call periods. Now, for some of us, and this is like one out of ten, out of every ten women, we suffer from endometriosis. This is my second surgery. Um, I had one when I was uh, 25, uh, some 20 years ago almost. <laughs> I'm now in my 40s. <laughs> Oopsie. Yeah, so this tissue in my case was... Uh, being, it couldn't be seen so well because ultrasounds don't pick them out so well. But you could see changes in the bladder, you could see changes in the colon and uh, the cervix and these organs in the lower abdomen. So they were adhered together because this tissue is at the wrong place and it keeps growing and it keeps sticking together the organs in my lower abdomen. I'm sure you've heard of the case of uh, Njambi Koikai who had endometrial tissue in her lungs. Now, for a long time, we've only thought that uh, this tissue responds to the cycle, but it's now emerging that this tissue creates its own estrogen. So it won't shed and respond like a normal period, but you will see something of a similar fashion. So I had an endometrial surgery for this tissue to be removed. I was opened up uh, through pots because of the laparoscopic uh, surgery. 
Some was removed near the bladder, some was removed in the cervix and all over these places. Ahead of that surgery, when I was given the costs, I was distraught because I could not afford it. For me, it was that I was going to have to live with this. Live with painful sex, live with painful defecation, going for long calls, going for short calls is extremely painful. Live with abdominal pain, and I'm talking about very severe pain. If you give me a one out, up to 10, I will give you a 10 for the pain. Live with nausea, live with bloating, bloating which hurts because it's not coming out and you feel like getting into your system or, or poking the, the intestines so that they release the, the gas. And I know there are many women out here who can relate to what I'm saying because some few people I've spoken to say, oh yeah, I also get that. Constipation and insomnia and then headaches. So that was the alternative. Live with that. Oh, and the pains would run sometimes, uh, the periods would run sometimes even for 14 days. And I almost used to feel like the woman in the Bible who touched Christ's hem. And there are many nights I, I prayed for a hem to touch Christ's hem because I'm a Christian. But God chose that I go through this path, or allowed it. So that's my most recent uh, experience. And because of that pain and the endometriosis, I have taken so many medications, which I will talk about at a later, uh, later time in this episode, uh, uh, show. Other than that, we also removed some fibroids. I had about six or seven fibroids in my uterus. Um, I also have adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is now this uterus, which, this uh, tissue which is supposed to be in the uterus, is growing in the wall of the uterus, not inside, inside the wall. So the cure to that is removing a uterus. They can at best debulk, but you cannot remove it. So you can only remove the uterus to cure that. Endometriosis, you can remove the tissue you might find in different places. So that also contributes to my lengthened periods, which can even go to 14 days. I had uh, my uterus debulked for that during the same surgery, and I had the fibroids removed, which are about six or seven. So I had an endometriosis surgery, uh, fibroids, and uh, the removal of adenomyosis, a different condition. Other than that, I suffer from hypertension, and most of the time, especially when I'm in severe pain and there are maybe infections uh, because of this tissue that's occurring where it should not be and it does not have an outlet out of the system, the system is struggling to fight it because it's inflammation, I end up with uh, very severe infections. It always affects my vitals, including my blood pressure and my temperatures. I get high fevers. So... At the same time, I have this Cossack's pain, and I was reading somewhere that um, sometimes endometrial tissue will rest at a scar. So you have this tissue targeting a place where you have a scar. Now for me, I have Cossack's pain. Cossack's is the tailbone of your spine. For the animals which is said didn't evolve, that cossix is a tail. For us human beings, it's just the end of your spine and you feel it when you sit. I would mostly feel it when I sit because of pain. And when I had severe endometriosis, I really had a lot of pain when I would sit. I sit on a donut because of that true sort of relieve me of the pressure, then the, the, the tailbone is hanging in the middle of the donut, donut cushion. So maybe just also to mention, I had an accident in 2018, that's around uh, five, six years ago, and I broke my Cossix, which already had a problem. So it was removed. But the place 
has what uh, doctors uh, call phantom pain. If you've had a limb amputated, that section will always pain. There will be some pain, some raw pain. They call it residual pain or phantom pain. So I've counted uh, five, adenomyosis, endometriosis, uh, fibroids since all this since my 20s, uh, coccidemia because of the coccyx pain, also since my 20s, hypertension since my 20s, and finally lupus. Lupus I have journeyed with since I was in high school as far as I remember. I always used to have joint pains and I would get kidney infections. And during one of its most severe flares, because lupus behaves in such a way that sometimes it, it goes on remission and at times it's in flares. So during one of those very uh, severe flares, I had just lost my sister. Um, I was peeing blood. My kidneys were just giving. Other than that, mostly lupus will have simultaneous joint pains. So when this is paining, this is paining. When these are paining, these are paining. This is paining, this is paining. This, yeah. So it's always simultaneous and regular. Yeah, and it's very severe. Now, I may not have the exact uh, timelines, but what I remember is throughout high school, if you could go to our high school clinic, which we used to call a sanatorium, you will get records of me being unwell. And even when we would be home, in fact, I remember one particular Christmas, we would make, we used to make so many chapatis and we were going on with the cooking and a goat being slaughtered somewhere. And I was in so much pain, severe cramps, but at the same time, a lot of joint pains, extremely painful uh, joints and it was happening on both sides and I explained to my mom that uh, I am having these crazy pains and she told me she actually dismissed it we all dismissed it that it's probably malaria so for a long time we dismissed it until high school in high school is when they followed through to it because then I was also um, repeatedly being uh, they were repeatedly detecting infection in my urine and it came to turn out that it was because the kidneys were getting affected they also were detecting detecting protein in the urine and that's a malfunctioning uh, kidney so it all began those days in high school that we finally got the lupus diagnosis the kidneys, and it was purely clinical. There were no tests uh, except for the ultrasounds. The kidneys, the urine tests, and the clinical presentation, meaning how I am, what I am telling the doctor, I have joint pains. I was given a diagnosis of lupus. So lupus is an autoimmune disorder. By being an autoimmune disorder, it means your body your body's immunity, instead of converging to attack just the enemies, the, the pollutants, the germs and the virus and homa here and an infection, that immunity, which if I was to liken it to a security for a home and you have a guard at your gate, instead of that guard going to fight off a stray cat and to redirect uh, some children who are coming to play in your compound who are, or, or a thief, fight off the thief, that guard is coming to fight you. So when your immunity fights itself, it is regarded that you have an autoimmune disorder. There's a wide range of autoimmune disorders and they manifest in different ways. For those of the connective tissue, connective tissue, which is protein uh, substance that you, you find the connective tissue. For those, and part of it is lupus, there is mixed connective tissue and all that, they also end up fighting. Your, your immunity fights you. 
so you end up with inflamed joints. As your immunity is fighting you, you will find that some organs will be affected. For me, my heart got affected and my kidneys got affected, though not very badly. It was uh, at a stage that could be managed. I also ended up with inflammation in my eyes and I would sometimes feel like I have sand in my eyes and they're dry, but in real sense, you can't see anything. At one point, and this is uh, in my 30s later, because of lupus, I got this strange rash all over my body and they could not get rid of it using uh, any antifungal, any antibacterial. They thought maybe it is a uh, chicken pox, it didn't work, but eventually it responded to steroids as an anti-inflammatory uh, drug. So what happens with lupus is it can attack any organ. It can attack your lungs, it can attack your heart, it can attack your skin, the skin being the largest organ you have. It can attack your kidneys. It can literally attack anywhere. And mostly and very predominantly, it goes for the joints. And that is how come most people with connective tissue diseases talk about joint pain and musc musculoskeletal, the joints and the muscles. So for me, I had a lot of joint pains. My heart was affected, my eyes, and also my kidneys. And the ultimate diagnosis was made in my early 20s. And at that point, um, I had a cardiac episode, like so something like a heart attack. All I know is I was in the ICU. I don't even remember the events very well. I was rushed there by an ambulance. I must have been 23. And they did all the tests they needed. And after that, they decided to do a test uh, to check on the autoantibodies, which is what they look for with connective tissue diseases. And they were able to confirm that it was a lupus diagnosis. So I left Aga Khan Hospital then with a lupus diagnosis when I was 23. Earlier, they just made a clinical presentation. They only as I end up with a and you're told, oh, no more joint, no more kutapika. You're in malaria, even without a test. So that was what it was initially and it was confirmed when I was in my early 20s. So I don't remember pain very well in my earlier days. Probably the joys outshadow the sorrows, childhood joys, oh, those are precious. Um, but I remember pain when I was in uh, class eight. That means I was about 13, 14. And looking at it, I got a diagnosis at 20, 22, 23. That means it took me 10 years to get an actual diagnosis. Between this period, there were times that I lived with my pain, ignored it, took whatever I could to suppress it, but whatever else degeneration may have been going on, went on because pain is just a symptom. Pain is an indicator from your body that something is wrong. If the joints and connective uh, tissue is getting uh, inflamed and you can see eventually my heart got affected, it means this went on for long and detected. And to add to that, an ENA, ANA, there are quite a number of tests, those auto autoantibody tests. First of all, at that time, it wasn't being done in Kenya. It was being done in South Africa. And for you to get that test done, now Lancet does it, you needed to part with a good number of thousands. So it is possible that there are many people walking out there with all manner of uh, symptoms manifesting in their bodies and they go to hospital and back and, you know, they're in and out of hospital and they do not know that they actually uh, live with lupus. And the other thing is there are very few laboratories that can do that test. And I think most of them take theirs to, to, to Lancet. 
take samples to Lancet. Most. Because even Aga Khan was not doing it when I got it, when I got the test done at Aga Khan. So basically you can say the state of diagnostics in Kenya is um, is pitiful. I realize I like to block pain. I think that's why I smile a lot. When the pain starts to overwhelm me, I quickly kick it out and want to be on the other side of life, which is less painful. Because I know there are times I would try and put a, push a pen through a joint to reach the pain. It's in there, it's not massageable. You've taken diclofenac, you've taken brufen. Sometimes they work because they're anti-inflammatory and what you're going through is inflammation. Sometimes they don't work. And as you keep scaling up the medication ladder, they get more and more expensive and more and more dangerous. They are risky to, like they have um, serious side effects. Most doctors I know in person know me as a lupus patient. In fact, anytime I sometimes go complaining about something, the first thing they say, I'm an lupus. Um, sometimes we even blame it on lupus when it's not lupus, I don't know. Because once you have this major diagnosis, then that's it. So I have some thrust into a lifelong pain, painful journey. And secondly, I now need to constantly have around me, and I always do, a painkiller. Even when I've traveled out of the country, I ensure I have a painkiller, just in case I may not be able to quickly get one because maybe they have a very controlled system out there. And a lot of times for anything that happens, you think it is the lupus. So maybe even there's something else and I don't know because I'm thinking it's the lupus. You struggle breathing in and there is some pain and you're told that you know, yeah, lupus sometimes also causes pleurisy. The lungs get affected. You're like, okay, it's the lupus. Pop more steroids. So I took a lot of steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They're called NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Started with prescription, but these are available. These are available across the counter. You can easily buy daclofenac, you can easily buy brufen, you can buy acyclofenac, you can buy meloxicum, you can buy aspirin. All these are drugs which are easily available. Those are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. On the other side, the very dark side, is this medicines erode your stomach lining, your gastric lining, gastric stomach yeah, lining. And at one point I had very bad pains again. And um, when I went for, I think it was a, an endoscopy, an endoscopy, the doctor says I had pores through my stomach, like areas where the stomach lining has been eroded, eroded. Like any further erosion will cause an ulcer somewhere or it could become porous and the stomach contents could spill into the cavity that holds everything together. You've started chicken. You don't find uh, everything in there. What's supposed to be in the intestines is in the intestines. So if an intestine is poked, stuff will spill out. There are people who have had very severe gastric lining inflammation that has resulted in that, and it's called uh, peritonitis. That's one of the, the causes. The other cause can be severe infection, stomach uh, infection. Yeah, but use of uh, NSAIDs causes drug-induced peritonitis. There are people who are taking brufen, left, right, center, diclofenac, without realizing the real danger they are putting themselves through. And sometimes if you have to take them, then please take them with um, 
these drugs which help with acidity like uh, esomeprazole, Nexium. But then there's also a danger to that. You take too much esomeprazole and Nexium, you're predisposing yourself to a kidney problem. Yes. So, but taking esomeprazole with brufen is like running into a house with a blanket, a house that's on fire. The fire might not catch you. That's what most doctors do. And for most of us I, and anyone who's watching, if you've been given diclofenac or brufen for a period of time, chances are the doctor has given it to you together with esomac, esomeprazole, nexium, or derelsagel. All that is supposed to prevent you from the side effect, which is eroding your lining, stomach lining. I continued with the on-off, the flares, and I even got to learn that uh, there are some triggers. A lot of stress is likely to push you into a lupus flare. I learned that managing life in a less uh, stressful way keeps the flares off. I also learned that uh, being too much in the sun is a, causes uh, flares. I learned a few flares here and there, so I started uh, introducing this in my coping strategies. I took on less stressful situations. I'm an empath, so I have to continually remind myself that, no, 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 I can't handle. Even if I want to handle, I can't. But still, if and when I got a flare, I took painkillers and there were times when the painkillers were ineffective and they were causing me side effects. Remember that, the gastric lining problem. Um, so they also would introduce different drugs. The doctors would introduce different drugs because they're now aware that I am already uh, an ulcers patient, peptic ulcers. I mean, they've already done the endoscopy and they've realized that I have peptic ulcers. So they started cutting off on the NSAIDs. <clears throat> there was a time I took um, a certain type of uh, steroid. I think it's called Metril. There's prednisolone I've also taken for so long. At the time I took Metril, if I'm not wrong, together with hydroxychloroquine, the one that people were taking when there was COVID, for six months straight every day until I finished. And the regimen was so complex. Like first one month, I think, or something, I was taking four, 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 four. Then by the second month, it was like four, four. And then like it went on and they have to be tapered because your body also produces its own steroids, cortisol. So when you're breaking it, you have to do it in a tapered manner. If you don't, you will go into a crisis. At the same time, lupus was affecting my skin. I was using hydrocortisone, the cream. I was basically just taking care of lupus and I was learning how to avoid flares. It doesn't mean that they will be gone entirely. They still do come. In fact, I remember once when I was at the university, may his soul rest in peace. Ali, our index one, uh, should I say the year? Okay, I will. In 1998, <laughs> we did our KCSE in 1998. Ali had gotten so interested in my pain. Ali passed on at uh, Kemri. He was our index one and he was a medic and he was so passionate about his work. Ali came to me and asked me if he could study my problem. Yeah, he was interested and we said he was going to. We get, I guess we will never get there. He passed on. Um, I really didn't understand what was going on. The pain was too much. Sometimes, there was even once a doctor, a, a psychiatrist was sent to me and they thought that I was either faking the pain. Until later, when now the second diagnosis came in, endometriosis, and I was operated on, and they took the tissue 
it was found in the pouch of Douglas. I also don't know where the pouch of Douglas is, but it's somewhere behind your back near your rectum area. Um, and that was removed and it was taken for to the laboratory for testing and it was endometrial tissue. It's not in the uterus. At least I got validated that I wasn't faking the pain. So there was lupus, then there was no endometriosis, and both are very painful. Somewhere along the way, I had an appendix rupture. <laughs> I remember that when I went to hospital and I was told that you need to be admitted, and I had had it with hospitals, and I said, I'm not going to be admitted. And I went back home. I barely entered my bed. I went back to hospital, and... They dashed me to theater. I was straight to theater. They, I think they did a quick scan and then after that, straight to theater. My appendix had ruptured and it was removed. I don't have an appendix. Yeah, so then the Cossacks, cor the tailbone, also joined in the foray, again in my early 20s. Somewhere along the way, um, I'm a single, I'm, I'm a, sorry, not single, I'm a teenage mother. I had gotten a baby somewhere earlier. Somewhere along the way, I was now getting my second baby. They discovered I also had fibroids. Adenomyosis was in question, but they weren't sure. That came later. It was just the other day. So it's been diagnosis after diagnosis after diagnosis and sometimes I'm like oh so this is what was causing this pain because I stopped looking at pain for pain I just treat it I sometimes get tired of queuing before a doctor who may want to start this process all over again let me tell you a story I had an accident in 2018 sorry there will be lots of back and forth and um i was really in pain but i was uh, self-medicating i self-medicated till now they had even introduced me to opioids and i was taking opioids myself and by then it wasn't so strict to get drugs like it is nowadays um and i went to hospital at some point and i told them my back is really hurting and I didn't know if it was related to the accident. I think I've been too sick. I don't relate things. I just treat whatever comes. And the doctor who was attending to me, and I remember his name, Brian. I should have taken the second name also. He asked me, are you stressed at work? He was trying to, he was questioning me towards the direction of maybe you're crazy or, or you're just tired. or well, this pain is made up. I told him, I'm really in pain. I can't sit. And when I stand, I also start feeling pain after a while. Um, and he said, I'll give you three days off. I think that should give you some rest. Then you can go back and work. His assumption was I was just faking pain. And I needed a sick off. I told him, I'm already on sick off. I don't need the sick off. And left it with him. The next day... I came back to hospital in a lot of pain. And I'd been given a tramadol injection before I left. And I was telling them the pain is here. They would insert the, the fingers digitally through the rectum and they'd say, I can't see anything, should be okay. The next day when I came, I was taken straight to the spine clinic at Aga Khan. And the doctor looked at me and looked at how I was sitting and said he wanted to have an x-ray of my lower back, both laterally, anterior, and whatever, so I think anterior lateral. And that x-ray came back with a broken cosix that Brian had given me three days off to go heal. Aga Khan normally has rounds, and during the rounds, the surgical team, the students, who are now studying to be surgeons, come round. After my surgery, I had a sur my surgery in Aga Khan with a spine specialist. Brian 
was amongst the team of doctors who were checking on the surgical patients. I told Brian, Brian, you gave me a sick off to take home a fractured corsix that needed to be operated on. Shame on you. So pain has shown me a side of humans where in our limitations, we blame the people who are going through pain. Instead of supporting them, even the medical doctors will sometimes be the very, very perpetrators of malice and of stigma to people who are in pain. And it's worse when it's a chronic condition because that means today is not the last day you're going to hospital. Sometimes you go to hospital hoping you will find somebody who will treat you, who, who will listen to you differently. Sometimes you go there and you clearly meet a newbie and you can see a rookie and you can see that this one is going to start asking me if I have traveled to Bungoma in the recent past and probably uh, malaria. So I have faced all that. But the worst is those that invalidate the patient's pain. The pain, because of living in pain, sometimes I want to live in the moment because I don't know if tomorrow I will be well enough to do this. I have found myself staying up until so late and now I, 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 now I, I have come to, to realize this about myself. I'll stay up so late because I don't know if tomorrow I'll be well enough to do a really good report. Let me do it today. I really do a lot of I don't know about tomorrow. Not that I'll be dead, no, but that I'll be in pain and you may not see it the way I'm feeling it. So what I do is I tackle a lot of things when I can and at that time. Pain has made me feel sorry for myself, which I don't like. I have had conversations with God where I'm so broken. I'm asking him why. Pain has made me plan for pain. I start a journey and I pack. I, first I will take some drugs. Then I will pack some that I will take after two, three hours. And that way all the way. And eventually pain has turned me into an addict, an opioid addict. Fortunately, I'm now on the road to recovery. Because opioids really sort out your pain. Pain has made me miss out on social functions. The other day we were burying my grandfather. I couldn't make it. The times I've sacrificed and shown up, but in a lot of pain. And the fact that pain like the Corsix is not visible Every other young person is serving the old people and you're seated. You look as if you feel too hot for us that you can't serve people. And whenever you say, oh, I had surgery or something uh, of that sort, they tell you, sisi tumefanyua, oanga piapa tumefanya surgery. <laughs> um, pain has made me have outbursts, anger outbursts out of the pain I feel inside me. And pain has also, in a way, turned me into a cynic. Sometimes I'm just bitter about life. And I just feel like, you're just lucky that you've not had an accident. <laughs> or you're lucky that you've not discovered this and that. I did nothing to get there. Pain has made me question God. Pain has made me not be able to give my best at work because in as much as I would like to, I'm in pain. And every time I'm in a lot of pain, my brain shuts down. 
I really do good work when I'm not in pain. Pain has made me taste cannabis. <laughs> yeah, and I had a bond with my father, a bond of pain. He also had a back problem and he used the exact medicine that I was using. And when he passed on, I used to feel his pain, literally. And when he passed on, I continued to take his medicine. And pain has put me on my knees to seek for help. Pain has taken me under the bed. You go under the bed to, to see if you will find something. That, I don't know what we go looking for under the bed. <laughs> when you're in pain, you sit down, you, you, you curl in this way. You say, let me walk. You can't walk. You stop right there. It's pain. Pain really just, uh, it makes us do very crazy things for me. I, I have gone to hospital and I am in pain and I'm telling the doctors, I am in pain. Just take care of my pain and I will go. I, I don't care for whatever else you want to do. You can follow the other medicines, just remove the pain. But they say it's a good thing to have pain because then you know something is wrong. It's an indicator. Yeah, for some of us, our life are like indications. Full pain. Yeah, so pain has affected uh, my life in many ways. Pain has, um, pain has taught me to appreciate the moment and to love the times when I'm not in pain. And sometimes when I look at, uh, especially my experience with opioids, even the times when I have, you know, something close to anticipatory bail, the, the way MPs go for anticipatory bail, me, I do an anticipatory pain injection because I'm like, I might feel pain. I don't even know, but I'm like, I, I, might, I, I think I'll feel pain. So let me plan for it. When you present yourself to hospital with pain, mostly the doctors will ask you to rate the pain. The nurses first, they'll ask you to rate the pain. They'll also look at you, how you're presenting. Um, sometimes someone is not wailing, but when you look at them, you can tell they're in a lot of pain. In fact, sometimes they say the one who's wailing is not in pain. I don't think I've wailed in hospital. I don't think so. I only wailed once when my son was uh, was having a, fe a fever, the fits, the febrile fits. That one I made so much noise. But pain can make you act in a very abnormal way, things you would never do. And you can even go to the pharmacy and say, I need something for this pain. Like, why am I here? I could have been in my house. And having had that experience and knowing that first of all, I'm going to go queue in the hospital. Oh no, first I'm going to have to leave my house to get to, from Siokimau to whichever closest hospital, maybe I'll spend about an hour. And a hospital that can attend to me. So this, this is my reasoning when I am in pain. I will spend this much time to go to hospital then I will sit down and wait for my number to be called. And then I will first go and be taken my temperature as if that is why I came. Wait. And the weight and the height. <laughs> and having crossed hospital corridors so many times, and I know, I know the, the drill. A lot of times I just want to get down to why are we here? And having uh, used opioids, because somewhere along the way, when the pain became intense and my vitals were getting affected, and now I even have a machine for measuring blood pressure in the house, when I know that my blood pressure is going up because of pain and I'm sweating and your tongue feels like it's full of, like you're full of saliva in your mouth and you almost want to throw up because of pain, why take myself through all that? 
So first things first is I always make sure I have stock of painkillers. This is perhaps because of our poor disposal system as a country where we don't have a way to return medicines that have not been used. Remember I even told you with my father's uh, medication, I took them and continued with them. Those are prescription drugs. Developed countries have something they call a disposal system. If someone dies, these medicines should be, uh, there should be a proper reconciliation. This person's medicines are here, they died, either we are going to incinerate them or something. This person has been changed medication, they are no longer on Panadol, they have now been put on Brufen. These Panadols have been removed. Same with opioids, because even opioids, they are, they are classes, there's low potent and highly potent. So I started with the low potent uh, opioids. After the, 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 the diagnosis of what I have, now whenever I present myself to a hospital with that diagnosis and with the scars that are visible because of surgeries, there's a scar here at my back, there's a scar here for the what, there's a scar down here, I have like about seven scars for the different times I've had either this or the other. Because of that now, doctors believe you start like you just tell them i'm in pain i've had my cosix removed they will believe you they don't even argue with you so at least now i have an easier time and in fact they know that chances are this one might not work for her in fact sometimes i even tell them don't waste your time giving me this drug it won't work and then I also tell them, don't give me NSAIDs, the diclofenax, the brufens, because they will erode my stomach. You will deal with two problems. You will give me a second problem. And when they erode, when it's so bad at that time, you actually end up also in pain. Extreme pain. It's like your insides are being cut by spears. So when I go to hospital now, because I am sort of, a known patient. I am a known coccyx. Uh, first, I've gone through a coccygectomy, the surgery, and I have a coccydynia, the pain. I am a known endometriosis. They can see the scars, and I have adenomyosis. I am a known. I have gone through um, the cysts, the ovarian cysts, uh, twice before. I'm a known, of course, appendicectomy. They can see that, and then they can see. I mean, they now can see, and then I'm a known lupus patient. So now they know that whatever pain she's talking about, if she says it's severe, it's severe. The other thing is I don't have a reason to lie about the pain. In fact, if I'm not in pain or if the pain is not severe, I'll not waste my time going to hospital. Those places are really boring. Hospitals are boring. Hospitals are long and tedious. If I can even treat my own child, I would treat them. I would not go to hospital. I would only go to hospital when I don't know what to do. But to go to hospital so that I, you tell me I have a home, I will not. To check my temperature, I have a thermometer in my house. My blood pressure, I have. I will only find myself in hospital when I really need to go to hospital. And I don't know why sometimes uh, medics treat people badly who are in hospital. Half the people I know would not even go to hospital. Half the men I know don't even want to go to hospital. So if you find someone there, they really have had to come. Either they've been convinced or dragged to that hospital. So for me, I found myself, once I checked into the opioids uh, class, it now became opioids all the way. And because of compression of nerves, I was also taking gabapentinoids. Gabapentinoids are drugs like gabapentin and pregabalin. They're not very common. They're used for people who have seizures and they're also used for treating nerve pains. There are others which I find very ineffective, like Sgineuro Forte. That one, I, there's a doctor who had given me and I just gave it back to him. I told him, what am, why are you giving me this drug? It won't work. The other alternatives to pain is sometimes I have to do physiotherapy. Physiotherapy helps, especially the, the tense, trans, trans, transelectric something. Uh, they, they do, they send uh, some stimulation electric stimulation into you. I think transelectric sim simulation, something, yeah. So that works. There's also the cold and very hot uh, towels. They wrap them well, so you just feel the heat. That works so well. And then the massaging. 
it helps sometimes to to relieve pain and uh, if at all it's a nerve i think it helps to ease it out back to opioids opioids work they're very effective but the way opioids were designed is such that they lock into the brain's opioid receptors the brain also produces its own uh, hormones which help you in the management of pain your body your body has its own way of managing pain it's not that, that all the time you're just waiting for a painkiller a lot of times you'll feel a little pain and you'll feel the pain go the bo body has its own but when you need the external ones and they lock into the receptors and you find that they don't last long they are off you start going into a cycle of repetitive taking it doesn't last but you need it it doesn't last but you need it and it's it's helping but it doesn't last you need another one so that is how people end up into it's habit forming actually they even warn you that this drug is habit forming that's how people end up addicted once you take uh, the tablets i think the tablets within 20 30 minutes you should start to feel relief and the tablets may last there's even one which can last as long as 12 hours if i'm not wrong I don't know about oxycodone well but this is tramadol. Tramadol has a slow release uh, version. Now injections within 4 minutes your pain is sorted. But it will not last for long. I think 3 to 4 hours. So if it's if it's pain that uh would have gone away somehow maybe the body would have found a way of managing it. It will go. If it's pain that was going to be there after that four hours, you will find yourself maybe again needing another one. The other thing about opioids, first it's habit forming. The other thing is it messes up with your pain modulators and even how you feel pain. Opioids actually make you end up having more pain. It's called hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia, yeah. So if this was normal pain, you feel like it's now a stone on you when you feel pain it really it messes up i think with the okay I, the, the technical aspects of it wouldn't make sense but something like the modulators it messes up with that so opioids will make you feel more pain so the trick with opioids is not to take them for long take them for as short a time as possible i don't even think you should do 2 weeks if you go longer than two weeks, chances are you'll become an addict. You will look for those opioids at the slightest pain. You will not take any other painkiller. And then if you are on injections, the process is even shorter and faster. The, it's so effective. And with the injection, you feel the euphoria. So the injection doesn't just take care of pain. It makes you feel so relaxed and peace. It's... It's as if, you know how you feel so nice uh, when someone hugs you, the feel-good hormones, even when you fall in love, even when you do exercises, it's some nice feeling you get dopamine. A nice, huge feeling. For people who's, um, there's a doctor who says that people who become addicts are people whose circuits were messed up with, maybe because of trauma, childhood trauma. There's a lot of uh, current uh, research around that, that it's childhood trauma that leads to addicts. I don't know how true it is, but if there are circuits within our brains which help us to, you know, benefit from the peaceful feeling, the feel-good feeling, for people who had those circuits broken, most of those will turn to addiction and the addiction gives them that. They feel good. The good feeling that you normally feel, they don't have it. But when they take opioids, they feel it. And it is so magnified that if, let's say, 10 ml of uh, morphine is a whisper, a nice whisper. Uh, sorry, 10, 10, an equivalent of 10 ml of exercise is a whisper. 10 ml of morphine is like an amplified speaker ah, ah, of pain, of, of sorry, of uh, feel good. 
of peace. Most people who take opioid, uh, sorry, who, who inject themselves opioids, the addicts, will tell you, I feel peaceful. And it's true. I can relate to it. You really feel calm and peaceful. The only problem is it's, it's habit forming. The other problem is it is never enough. The body keeps demanding for more. And the more you take it, you get to a point where your body reaches its limit and you go into respiratory depression and you die. I talk to my friends a lot. I'm lucky to have very good friends and my spouse. Um, I actually didn't notice when it was escalating, but I had a very bad uh, back pain. This has gone on for a while, almost two years. I'm not sure if I was an addict for those two years, but I was really an addict for four months. That one I can say for sure. From after surgery, all the way to December, September, October, November, December. I was a proper addict. But all this while, I used to get injections of tramadol. Tramadol is not so bad. But eventually, I got access to a strong injection, even fentanyl. I had access. I had access to any drug I wanted. And I know how to administer an intramuscular injection, whether it is on the glutes, Thighs or up here, detroit muscles. I know how to administer it to myself. I used to do it for my sister who passed on with me. Now, I tend to think I was also in transition this last year. My dad had died. I hadn't processed the death so well. And my dad and I were very close. I had gotten married. I kept feeling like my dad was missing out in my marriage. I was now a wife. I'm out of theater. My mother-in-law is visiting. I'm supposed to be taking care of her. Everyone is following up with me. The, 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 the cost of the operation was expensive, so I had a lot of support from friends. So I also wanted to report good reports. I'm good. I'm good. So I would host people. And then I'm an empath. And anyone who had a problem, I would be there for them. Little did I know, I was draining myself. I was not recovering. I was not healing. In fact, if anything, I was going into more pain. So I started looking for, I need that injection again. Because now it had been stopped at hospital. But I'm coming back to a home where people are coming to see me and they're expecting to see someone who's okay. I was not okay, but I was okay. I was dealing with so many things. I was not working. Joblessness. And yet I have to report to all these people who care for me that I'm okay. So I slept. I slept all the way. I was just saved by the grace of God from death. Because there's a time I took 10 vials, 2 mLs, 100 mGs of pethidine a whole night. 10 I don't think anyone would survive that. And I blacked out and I, you know, you wake up later and you cannot even recollect what happened. And it's not once, the 10 vials was once, but the blacking out was several. Now here I was taking 100 mLs and not one vial, but 10 vials. And when you use them so much, it because it's habit forming and you become tolerant, you use one, the pain is still there. You need another one, so you use a second one. Maybe the pain goes. I wake up again, use one, use a second one. Pain goes. Then I decide, let me try three. I see if now I will feel nice. So I found myself going down this drain. For that night, I did 10 vials. They come in strips of 100, M 100 mg. So I draw in, I know what to do. The other good thing is I was doing it in a proper manner, sterile, clean, uh, clean uh, whatever, syringe, and used needle. And for that, 
I really hope that the government has very good harm reduction uh, facilities for anyone who is injecting themselves because they are still going to inject themselves. So it's best they inject themselves in a sterile way where we will not have them share needles and spread HIV and spread hepatitis and other blood infections or even kill themselves in the process. So I'm a proponent for harm reduction strategies. If you're going to inject yourself, then I pray that we have a program in place to promote harm reduction. So I had gone past the pain to the good feeling, something which I'd been deprived of because of pain. I'd be able to sit down with guests and laugh after I take an injection. I'd go upstairs, take an injection, come back, ah, karibuni, amini mepona, si unana natembea. Because that's what people want to hear from me. They've supported me. They've supported my health. I feel like I need to report a good report. So I host them. Hey Trish, kuneza kutembea kweli? Ah, mina kupikia chai. That was me. So the factors that also underlie those habits need to be established. Some people are in very bad family dynamics. Even if they're in pain, they also have other underlying factors. But pain is a common underlying factor. There are those who take heroin. Now that's an illicit drug. It's not a prescription drug. It's dangerous for two reasons. You don't know if it's laced with something else and you don't know the quantities. You could be taking this a thousand for all you care or something laced with fentanyl. You don't know. I didn't take up to the fentanyl addiction. I thank God for that. I don't know why, but I had access to them. But I had used a fentanyl patch for my back pain given by a doctor before, and it used to work very well. But I had been told that they are not in supply anymore. Like for my wedding, I had a patch for three days. Yes, I was so happy. No pain. I was dancing. I was in high heels. I love it when I'm not in pain. I know that I can, you know, hang out with people, laugh and joke. I can even run. I mean, do you know I couldn't run? I couldn't wear heels. My heels have been rotting away. People take them because I don't wear them anymore. Now I do this just for show. After that, I go into flats. Yeah, so your life is robbed. Pain robs you of life. Pain just leaves a shell of you. And when you get anything to a semblance of life, you want to hold on to that. And the people who created the opioids knew what they were doing, that a lot of us would be addicted. I'm a very realistic person and sometimes truthful to a fault. I can tell you when I'm struggling, if uh, you're close within, and I can tell you when things are thick. I shared and said uh, and told both my family and a friend that I was, uh, after that night, that I was an addict. Um, I went and saw a pain specialist, very good doctor. I'll not say his name here. Very good doctor. He looked at it holistically, psychosocial, spiritual, biological, the whole thing. And he gave it to me. He broke it down for me. He even told me for your back, we eventually will have to do a nerve block because this pain is going to be with you for life. We'll do a nerve block. Nerve blocks will give you relief for a while. All I want is to be able to live again. That's what I told him. I want to live a normal life. I don't want to live a life where I'm wondering how to sit, you know, or people are looking for a special seat for me. I just want to be comfortable and normal again. And he also made me see a psychiatrist. And then together they 
put me on a regimen. Low, low uh, opioid, low potent opioid, the gabapentinoids, uh, a bit of physiotherapy, and uh, there was a, um, one of those psychotropic drugs, I think um, an antidepressant or something, I'm not so sure. There was a drug that was given by the psychiatrist. I forget the name, it was me something. And then he also gave me something to sleep because my anxiety levels shot when I would know that now I don't have anything to take care of pain. What if pain comes? Do you know I would just think about only that? What will I do? If pain comes, oh, I'll work. I'll do, you know, I would find ways to, to go around with the what if pain comes. So my doctor was very, very cordial and he was so understanding. So I was still on an opioid, but a low potent opioid. And that is what I take to date, together with the gabapentinoids. Uh, the sleeping pill on off, not all the time. But then uh, sometimes, no, I'm no longer on the, uh, the drugs that I was being given by the psychiatrist. I am due to go see him. He asked me to go see him when I'm ready for the nerve block. I don't know if it will be an injection. I don't know on the spine. I have no idea or surgery. I don't know. I'm just waiting for that time to come. But yes, it took a lot of being open. Um, there is a time I relapsed in December festivities. People were having so much fun. I was in pain a bit. And I needed to also just have fun. You should see me in a party. I'm the party animal. Um, so I, I just felt like I needed to get a boost and, you know, have fun and dance with everyone else, you know. And it was homework, and your maka, kufosi, something. And I was just having fun and other part dancing and I was learning the moves. Of course, I don't know the moves. Yeah, so I'm waiting for the time when I will go for the nerve block for now. We are on a low period, low potent opioid and a gabapentinoid and a sleeping aid for when I need it. I don't look like the average addict the average in fact my hair my hair is just out of laziness to braid it normally i have a very neat look um the average addict is dirty looking has piercings uh didn't shower was almost forced to come here and then the average addict labdata agenda shule aliachia mali Amesumbua wazazi. Mimi sijawai sumbua wazazi. In fact, may my dad's soul rest in eternal peace. My dad was very proud of me. He used to love me so much. My mom loves me too. Like you're not like my dad. My dad used to adore me. Um, I have never disturbed my parents. Even though I was a teenage mom. That's a story for another day. I've never slept out of home. And when I'm at my mother's place, even visiting, I have never been home after dark. I am anything but the average addict profile. Why I decided to come out is, number one, to let people know that this can happen to any of us. And maybe some of us are hiding and then I thought, if I can talk about it, they'll probably give addicts an ear. Because like they are, they're not listening to addicts. They're thinking, what do these guys know? When I talk to a pewe, mshara na wajafanya kazi. Maybe they're not even able to work. You first need to treat the addiction. Maybe they're dealing with other dynamics. I came out because I know that underneath every addict is an underlying factor. It could be socioeconomic. They are dirty, maybe because they cannot afford water. That money 
they would rather go and buy another injection of heroin or something. So I came out to perhaps question normal thinking, what we call the orthodox ways that addicts need to be looking this and that way. Addicts are so many other people we live with. And as at now, after running, um, I run the Beyond Conditions uh, podcasts where I advocate for those people who live with uh, chronic conditions, those of us, to be able to realize a full life despite living with uh, chronic conditions and navigating health intricacies. Um, I came out because I'm challenging the norm. I'm wanting the world to know that we are living with addicts who are afraid to even talk to us. They are dying amongst us. How many ODs are we hearing about? That OD was not a suicide. It is somebody who didn't come out. They thought they were having a high and they will wake up and take the next. It was never a suicide. When I realized that I had many possible suicides and yet I wanted to live the next day, I did not want to, to die. I was just going to fix a pain and get a high. I had every plan of being at the next party. But tolerance pushes their limits. Their respiratory system depresses and we find them dead with an injection near them. Those guys had no intention of dying. It is a death that caught them unawares. So I'm here because once I started talking about that opioid thing, I have about four doctors who are addicts, who have told me they're addicts. I have heard from nurses. I have heard from sisters whose nurses, sorry, ladies whose nurse sisters, their sisters are nurses, are addicts. I've heard of friends who tell me, we take care of so-and-so, and she keeps asking for this injection. They're suspecting she's an addict. Yes, she's sick, but the level at which she's taking the opioids are too much. People have come out talking about it. Somebody came and told me, Trish, after I had my knee surgery, I have never stopped taking opioids. The fact is, and the truth is, we have a lot of people who are opioid addicts. And not just the prescription opioids. And not just non-medics. But we are talking about medics who are hooked. And we are also talking about patients who are hooked. And we are also talking about the general public people who are hooked and who are hooked to the illicit drug. That is the unfortunate truth that we as a society need to come face to face with. And it pushes me to think along harm reduction uh, practices because we, we need to embrace this as a society that it is possible to get hooked, first of all. The only reason people don't talk about being hooked is because they're embarrassed. There is nothing embarrassing about a disease. It is not. It's almost taking me back to the 80s when people were embarrassed because they had HIV. And people had to come up who now talked about it for us to embrace it. And then we started giving uh, condoms because we realized that abstinence is a facade because we realize that being faithful is a lie. And we realize that people needed to be given condoms. And even with condoms, we're still burying people of HIV. Even with condoms and even with medication. But it's not as bad. This is the same case with drugs. And for me right now, I am, first of all, claiming my right to health. Addiction is not a moral issue. Addiction is a health issue. Why would you jail an addict? What are they going to do in that jail? 
go and get more drugs and become hardcore and come back into this society after a year or two so that they can become even bigger hardcore. Do you know an addict will forfeit a meal and go for the drug because his body is held captive to the opioid. How can you help that person? You treat them. Let's face it, it is a health issue. You may have gotten addicted because, like me, you are a person who suffers from chronic pain. Granted, you still are an addict, you need treatment. You may have gotten addicted because you went to a party, somebody introduced you to a drug, and then the next, and now you're an addict. You may have gotten an addict, addicted because at your workplace, you're a medic, a doctor, or a nurse, and you got uh, access to these drugs, or you're a, phys a pharmacist. Different ways, but same outcome. You're now an addict. You need to be helped. You need to be assisted. And from where I stand, it's about time the government worked together with the different other authorities like NACADA and different hospitals uh, that are um, um, mandated to take care of our mental health. It's about time all of us came together and accepted that addiction is a disease. That it's possible someone is addicted because of many other factors. They have no job. They are feeling sorry for themselves. They're sitting there. They end up with a drug. It gives them a high. They feel a bit better about themselves. Then they stay there. Then they become an addict. Then you jail them. They were not working. Now they're in jail. You'd rather run a jail system. Then they come out of jail after three, four years. They are even now a hardcore addict. They probably were just a low-level addict. Now they are hardcore addicts. Chances of them going back there are so high. In fact, now this time, they will steal someone's bag to go and buy the drugs. Let alone this one where you caught them because they were somewhere in the, in the slum. We have a constitution that uh, protects our right to health, social and economic rights, grant Kenyans their rights. And I'm here today to categorically say that I stand for harm reduction. The other thing I stand for is give people naloxone, give them uh, suboxone and give them methadone. These are medications that are given to help you ease off opioids. The thing about opioids is when you stop taking them, you feel so sick. You go through what they call an opioid withdrawal. I, I didn't go through it because I was tapered off. I have been reduced. You see, when they give me low potent opioids, they are tapering off and they are addressing my pain. So you go to someone and you want to cut off uh, opioids. That person, the minute they see another injection, they will take it so that they now act normal, so that they become normal. Because the normal for them is not the suffering you want to subject them to. When such a person uh, is told to stop taking drugs, the only thing they think of is the misery they are going to go through. They will feel sick. They literally have pain in which they didn't even have. They will throw up. They will not sleep. They'll be anxious the whole time. Such a person will not stop taking those drugs. That person will find a way to hide to you that they're not taking the drugs because the only way they're becoming normal is by taking drugs. What you need to do is slowly ease them off the opioids. People are even given uh, implants. There are very many people out here in developed countries who are now normal humans because they were supported through the withdrawal process. And they have never gone back to crime. And they are living testimonies. And these are evidence-based approaches, medical-assisted treatment, and then therapies, and all the, these other things, and support by families. Let people get educated. And that is why I actually run the Beyond the Conditions platform for education on different things, not just this one but on different issues. And as I come out here and talk about myself, I am well aware of the risks and everything that I'm putting myself to, but I'm also well aware that our right to health is enshrined in the Constitution. And if and where it has not been well defined or well interpreted, then it's about time someone did it for those who are 
struggling with addiction, opioid addiction. The thing about me is, uh, first, I have very loving children. And um, I really, I raised them alone for a while before I got married. If there's one thing I'm committed to is ensuring that they live a better life than mine. And every day I wake up, I want to do that for them. And when I think about my children, I think about many other children who may be looking at me. I may not know them. And I really can just see my neighbor's child. She really likes me. There are many other people who look up to me. The far I have come means my influence is wide. So in as much as I have dropped, this never went. The influence remained. Those are the people who believe in you, even when you are at your lowest. That keeps me going. And it makes me not want to lose sight of those happier times, of the victories I have achieved, and of the times when I have excelled. I have excelled so much. I'm sure if you look through my profile, I have um, I have showcased myself. The world can see I can do it. All these things notwithstanding, all the failures notwithstanding. I don't... Uh, I don't focus on the timelines. I don't look at the, the difficult moments. And that hasn't been easy. It's also taken a lot of um, support and reminders from friends. Even the slightest thing I contribute to a friend's life, and maybe they, they, they reach out and they ask her my idea to this and that, and I contribute something so important, they're like, ah, if you are the Minister for Education, we would not uh, be having this confusion for schools opening. <laughs> it keeps me going. Um, hope. Hope for a better tomorrow. Even with a really damp day today, that hope keeps me going. There are times when things have really been bad and there has arisen a phoenix out of the ashes. I am a believer of that. My husband, he has a lot of faith in me. He supports me even when I'm such a letdown. And every time I remember that, I'm like, you know what? You've got to make this guy proud of you. He is proud of you and everyone else is not. But I'm very lucky to be surrounded by a lot of very loving people, truly loving people. I'm, I, don't, I know that there are those who don't care and all that. I don't focus on that. I know my strengths, that's the other thing. I was raised up by a very strong father. I know my strengths. And I have a very strong faith in God. Um, and even when I'm really ill, I listen to a lot of classical music, Mozart and everything, but I also listen to Don Moen. His voice is so soothing and he helps me to tap into my inner ability to heal. So, and... All these reminders, I think I mentioned at the beginning that to many people, I am a true reflection of what, of how resilient the human spirit is. That keeps me going. Sometimes I feel like if I fall, all these people will stop believing in this, which is, I don't know how true that is, but if it means that I will help to keep another, afloat and to make another strong and to keep another going I will keep on going and I know that things are gonna be different and one day I'll come back here and tell you that I told you that things are gonna be different and I started the Beyond Conditions uh, YouTube channel I mentioned earlier it um it's, we share our lived experiences as people who live with chronic conditions on that channel. And so far, I have started by my, my own. And I bring on the wisdom of many others who have walked down the same path as me. This channel uh, is big on community. It's founded on community, on compassion, 
or knowledge sharing, awareness. And I'm aware that a lot of us out here are not as educated. Education does not mean, mean you will hear it once and believe it. Maybe they need to hear it two times or three times. They probably heard it somewhere else. They'll hear it from me. They may hear it somewhere else. And then they'll finally say, you know what? I think there's something in this and they will go deeper to dig it up. Um, but bringing this together to supporting and enabling and empowering those who live with chronic conditions to realize a full life, the potential of a full life, despite navigating all the intricacies of healthcare, even when ours is failing, even when ours, the doctors are working in the worst conditions. And I thank them for the work that they do for us. So I believe in a better tomorrow. And that's a belief I've held since I was a kid and one that I do not intend to let go of. And should I falter, I know that I'm surrounded by a strong support network to remind me that, Trish, you are a believer. I am a believer. And I am aware that there are times when we are failed by the very people we look up to, the ones we are depending on. Our support systems get tired of us. I do hope that you can still look within you. And even if the victory or the, the light in you is at the slightest, it is enough for you to keep it warm and grow it day by day, minute by minute, because it is inside you the spirit to fight on. It is inside you the spirit to believe.